just wanted to start out by letting you guys know what I do, because sometimes there is a little bit of confusion about what a children and a family pastor is. So uh, this year, this is what parents think I do. I'm goofing around with the kids in there. This here is what my friends think I'm doing all week long. <laughs> this is what society thinks I do. <laughs> this is what you guys think I do. Making games for the kids. Here's what I think I do, bringing everyone together, tell them about Jesus. But here's what I actually do. <laughs> hmm. Okay, guys, we are in a sermon series called Boost. And uh, each week we have been looking at how we receive instant, continuous help from the Holy Spirit. So, um, in nature of Kids Church, we're going to start by playing a game. <laughs> I'm going to give you the recap, and you're going to tell me who preached this sermon. <laughs> First, we looked at how Holy Spirit is personal and present, and we were encouraged to grow in our revelation of Holy Spirit so that we can enjoy his intimate friendship and his partnership, the Godhead with us. Who preached that sermon? No, no. Who? Who? You have a 50-50 chance here. <laughs> Pastor Carl, that's right. Good job, Jen. Okay, next, somebody reminded us that... <laughs> The Holy Spirit actually closes the gap between how we view ourselves to be and how we really are. The Holy Spirit, our divine identity coach. And somebody really wants Swedish berries over here. <laughs> okay. Oh, then it was suggested that we actually take time in a really special place to pray. Because if we can take religious legalism, put that aside, take our busyness, put that aside, we will hear from Holy Spirit. Who told us that? Oh, who said it first? <laughs> uh, this is for Swedish Fish. Who said it? Somewhere over there. Okay, you guys are kind of good at this. <laughs> ah, then we looked at the life-giving Holy Spirit, how he powerfully applied the death and resurrection power of Christ to us. He made us new. He's now present within us, giving life to our body, alive in our hearts, revealing stuff to our minds real time, moment by moment. His influence working in us make us reveal God in our walk and our talk. Who could have typed that out? <laughs> Oh, I heard something over here. Pastor Zach. All right. Last week, we were actually given a really amazing prophetic sermon. Jesus as the bridegroom, providing Holy Spirit as new wine. We just abolished an old system. It couldn't satisfy external powerless exercises over. And now not last. Now we have an inward abiding new way. Who preached that? Oh, right back here. You want some Reese's Pieces. There you go. Good job, everybody. I'd give yourselves a clap for that. Well, today I want to talk to you guys about Holy Spirit boosting our vision. Because when Holy Spirit boosts our vision, it results in masses of people, a move of God, and more capacity.
So I'm going to start by telling you guys a story from Acts 10. Um, I'll tell it to you guys. If you want to look it up, you can. But this is in a special translation, the Kelly paraphrase. So... <laughs> <clears throat> Here we go. <laughs> in Caesarea, there's this guy. You guys are going to like this. There's dreams, visions, angels, the end of racism. Like the whole thing happens here, okay? So there's this man named Cornelius, and he was a Roman military officer. So already, hoo -hoo. <sighs> he was devout, and all his household revered God. And he had a heart for the poor, and he gave generously to them, and he constantly prayed to God. One afternoon, he had a vision. And one of God's angels said, Cornelius. I don't know. Maybe he said, hey, Cornelius. I don't know what he said. <laughs> but he called him Cornelius. So he looked hard at him. He was terrified. What is it? sir. <laughs> he said, your prayers and your generosity have come to God's notice. <laughs> he said, send some men to Joppa, ask for Peter. He's staying with a man called Simon. He's got a place on the sea. So the angel went away and Cornelius automatically, he called two from his household over and he also called his right hand man over and he sent them off to this place called Joppa. So the next day, these three guys from Cornelius's men, you know, they approach Joppa, and Peter, he goes up on the roof to pray. It was midday. He ordered some lunch. He's waiting for lunch, and he says, I'm going to go pray while I'm waiting. And while that happens, he falls into a trance. Mm -hmm. He saw heaven opened up. And something resembling like this large linen tablecloth, it descends from above, le being let down from earth by its four corners, north, south, east, west. It floats down. And he saw that it actually held many kinds of animals, four-footed animals, reptiles, birds. And a voice says to him, Peter, go, prepare them to be eaten. Certainly not, Master. I've never eaten anything forbidden or unclean. Or maybe, oh, I've never eaten anything forbidden or unclean. And again, I don't know how they said it. But he said, no, I've always followed our Jewish laws. What God has made clean, said the voice for the second time, you must not regard as common. And this all happened three times. I don't know why everything three times for Peter, but anyways... Suddenly, the cloth is whisked back up to heaven, and Peter's stunned, and he's trying to figure it out, figure it out, what does this mean? And at that moment, the three guys show up. Hey, is there someone named Peter here? Peter, he's still lost in thought, like, wake up. So the Holy Spirit spoke to him, and he said, look, there's men searching for you. It's all right. Go with them. Don't be prejudiced. I've sent them. <laughs> so Peter went down. He said, here I am. I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? So they explained why they were there. And he invited them in. He put them up for the night. And uh, him, some of the Jewish believers with him, they all went to Cornelius' house the next day. So they reached Caesarea, and Cornelius had summoned his relatives and close friends and was waiting for him. And they talked together, and Peter came in. He found so many people assembled, and he said, you must know that it's forbidden me, for me, a Jewish man, to come in and mix with you, a Gentile. But God showed me. God showed me I should call no one common or unclean. And he said, so I came. Why did you send for me? So Cornelius again explained the whole vision, why he sent him. And he said, so you were kind enough to come. And I've gathered my family and we're all in God's presence. And we're ready to listen to what the Lord has to say. Peter took a deep breath. He began. 
and he continued to share the good news of Jesus with them. And while Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit cascaded on all of them. And the Jewish believers that were with Peter, they were shocked. And they, Peter said, hey, this happened to them just like it happened to us? Who can deny them to be baptized? So they got baptized and then they asked him to stay for a few days. Yeah. Let's pray. <laughs> Oh, God, <laughs> I ask that this message does not go from my lips to their ears, but I ask that this comes from my very heart and spirit right to theirs. Holy Spirit, we invite you now to boost our vision. Amen? Okay. Hmm. Well, what I want to do is I want to share with you guys how Holy Spirit has actually been boosting my vision. How Holy Spirit has been speaking to me about including masses of people, more people. Before the pandemic began, we were averaging 50, 60 kids per weekend, and they were all coming through our doors. And I was actually looking to build the team to be able to hun uh, handle 100 kids per weekend. I know. And so we were going to put in a, a fourth kid's room, you know, have a special place just for those preteens. We had two services going. Like, we were cooking. And then the pandemic hit. <laughs> and we had to close. And when we opened... I was only legally allowed to have 15 children per room. And then we opened and closed and opened and closed and opened and closed. <laughs> and we no longer had 50 to 60 children coming anymore. Oh, man. <laughs> so Holy Spirit began to boost my vision. <sighs> it was in 2020. And I really started looking into some classroom stuff. I was trying to dig in. And as I was looking it up, I clearly, I clearly heard the voice of God. And this is what he said. Because I was looking up classroom stuff. You're not the teacher. You're the principal. So I knew what this meant to me. And to me, this meant my vision was too small. I was just looking at a classroom of children. I had to pull back. I had to see how can I restructure, reorganize, redefine what kids' ministry could be. Holy Spirit wanted to boost my vision and wanted me to include more people, more children. So... It was time to take a step. Yeah. So I got to work. <laughs> uh, I'm in a couple of kids' ministry groups online, and this is how I like to start. Hey, what books should I read if you're in kids' men? <laughs> and I pray, prayerfully researched the books that they suggested, and I started working my way through it. I was reading, beginning to implement some of the things that um, I was learning. And one of the first things is our volunteers... They are not volunteers at all. They are life changers. Mm -hmm. And I have been working hard to show them how valuable and how appreciated they truly are. Some of them are new, and some of them are long-term consistent members who have been living their Jesus lives in front of the children. And you guys are feel free to honor them right now. That's for you, all my life changers. <laughs> I have been also asking for so much more feedback from the life changers, from the children themselves, and from the parents. And I've since changed the recruiting approach. You know, all good things, but mm, I knew there was more. <laughs> so a couple months later, 
an elder comes into the church when we were over on Hamilton Road. And uh, he was there for something other. But he says, how, how are you? How are you doing? And I explained how God was just pouring out fresh vision on me for the children and everything that was happening. And, you know, and he said, I have a word for you. Okay. <laughs> God is going to crack open a book that has never been opened before. And it will be a key to kids' hearts. And it won't be a regular book, but it will be a 3D book. Wow. <laughs> so that was overwhelming to hear. And I don't believe I actually had a full understanding of what that meant, but it told me I was on the right path. Peter did not know why he was going to Caesarea, but he knew he was supposed to go there. So it was time for another step. So I had a meeting with pastors. I brought them up to speed with everything God was doing in my heart. Now, I have heard it said that it's not common for senior leadership to value children. But let me, let me tell you that they do in this house. Pastor Cheryl herself has given more hours and more effort to children's ministry than any other executive pastor ever has. Fact. <laughs> pastor Carl is continually promoting and advocating the importance of this great ministry. Mm -hmm. So together, they always just give me a collective yes. <laughs> so with their blessing, with their full support, I was ready to keep at it. And in the meantime, I saw all of the life changers get closer to the children. I saw all the impact come, kids come, and actually, you know, they're making friends. I'm seeing a community develop. And in fact, I'm actually seeing parents and families here today, our attendance rise, because what is happening over there in this classroom? Good things are happening at Impact Kids. Because when Holy Spirit boosts our vision, it results in masses of people. You see, this Bible passage starts with God drawing Cornelius to himself, his family too. And he was preparing Cornelius to receive him. And he was sending Cornelius clear messages because uh, he wants to extend his grace and his goodness. So I'm asking you, who is God preparing right now? Who is receiving clear messages right now? Go to Impact Church. Hear what they have to say. Go see the extreme love that they walk in. So after Cornelius sent for Peter... God also started to boost Peter's vision too. You know, like I said, Peter's hungry, orders lunch. He's praying, waiting for food. And God gave him a vision, used food to do it. Some of you are about to go on the routines of your everyday life, ordering lunch, and God is going to speak to you. <laughs> and I do not want you to dismiss this as your own thoughts because you have a different idea of what it means to be spiritual because I'm going to tell you what it sounds like. It's going to sound like, hmm, my neighbor's lawn is getting long. Maybe I'll go over and mow it. It's going to sound like, hey, do you want to come to church, come to my place for a barbecue after? It's going to sound like inviting people into our lives because when God wants to boost our vision, it results in masses of people. So we just need to continually make this circle wider and include more and more and more people. When Peter went to Cornelius' place, <laughs> we find out this. Cornelius summoned his relatives and close friends and was waiting for him. I am telling you right now that God is preparing people's hearts. 
And they are right now gathering their relatives, gathering their close friends, and they are waiting for you. They are waiting for us. They are waiting for Impact Church. Peter walked into that room and his whole family was assembled. There was a crowd assembled. Guys, hmm, there are so many families waiting for us. I researched our new neighborhood that we're moving to. Mm -hmm. Do you want to know what? 67 to 87% of the households in that area have children. And the population growth for that neighborhood, the projection, it is through the roof. So it is time. It is time for masses of people, more people to be included. It's time for Holy Spirit to boost our vision. And when he does, a second thing happens. There is always a move of God. Holy Spirit has been boosting my vision by showing me that more people, children and families, need to be included. And Holy Spirit has been telling me how there is going to be a move of God. He wants to replace this picture of like a judgy, boring God. And he actually wants to replace that so that people experience his goodness and his grace. He wants to give church a new connotation. As a staff, we have a little chat that we communicate in. And uh, at the beginning of the year, Pastor Zach, he popped up a sermon. He said, oh, it's pretty good, so I had to listen. It was a message by Pastor Peter Haas from Substance Church. And um, he was talking about, you know, make sure you have a kingdom lens and a, and a kingdom focus for the times that we're living in. And he went on to tell us about several books that he read that spoke about history cycles. There's war cycles, institutional cycles, economic cycles. Um, it turns out that every 95 years, like on the button, there's a major war and it actually reshapes world order. And the weird thing is, is that it actually occurs with very predictable frequency. And then every 80 years, there's a shift in how people relate to government and institutions and the economic cycle every 50 years. But the funny thing is, is that these cycles go all the way back to like the 1400s. And he put it all out on a map. And it's shocking at how exact these cycles are. But right now, we are coming to a time when it's, there's a convergence and all three are coming to a peak. Yeah. yeah. Well, he didn't say this to scare his church. Uh-uh. Because we could be praying. We can be getting ready to minister. He said it so that we can adjust and become instruments of God. But guys, he showed us another cycle. One that's just as predictable. And it too can be traced in history at very particular times without fail. And that's an awakening cycle. After all these wars, after all this distrust in media, after disillusionment with institutions, there comes a renewal from God. There always comes a move from God. <clears throat> I am telling you that there is a great big move of God coming and the generation that is leading that move is alive today. They are already born. So what I would highly suggest is that if you want to get into alignment with what God is doing, that you get into young adults, you get into teens, or you get into children's ministry, because it is time for all hands on deck. Because these are the people who are actually going to change the world. If we do not put our focus on these ministries, I'm telling you guys, we are missing it. Like, I do not know in the past two years if you've ever had this thought, why didn't I invest in Zoom? Why didn't I buy a mass company? I'd be rich. 
I'm telling you what, if you invest in young adults and youth and children today, you are investing at the right time because there is going to be a payday. There is going to be a move of God and we have to rise up, get this generation risen up so that they can bring God's grace and goodness to the world. And if you're here today and you are young, <laughs> get ready to lead. There is a call on your life and God wants to partner with you. And one day you are going to be leading Impact Church's biggest locations. So needless to say, I was all sorts of fired up. <laughs> but I still had questions, you know, like... What's it going to look like for God to use youth and kids? Like, how do we equip them for that? See, Holy Spirit was boosting my vision. I could see masses of people were to be included. I could see a move of God's goodness is and is going to be poured out. But I still knew there was more. So time for another step. You see... Peter started to tell Cornelius and his family about Jesus. And while he was still speaking, God poured out his Holy Spirit. God was so excited, he couldn't even wait for Peter to stop talking. He just had to show up, Peter, stop talking. And the Jewish believers they were uh, who came with Peter, they were so surprised. And they were shocked. They didn't think God could reach them. And I'm telling you that if you think someone is out of God's reach, you need a new picture of God. <laughs> He's mighty to save. And he does not use his great power to be cruel to people, but he uses it to lovingly draw people to himself. There is no heart that is out of God's reach. There is nobody too far gone. You know, even in the stories prior to this one I read to you in Acts, we see an Ethiopian, Ethiopian dignitary, we see Saul a Jew, and now this Gentile family all coming into the family of God. Uh, sometimes they call it the Gentile Pentecost. And I'm telling you that me and you would not be here today if that did not happen. Because throughout history, though, there is always a through line of God's goodness, and that will never, ever cease. And we need to get ready for another move of God, another one that is going to change the course of history. And I can already tell you that this move will be the unfiltered, not diluted, pure grace and of God and his absolute goodness. And I'm telling you that you are going to be surprised at who receives God in these coming days. And the landscape of our church is about to change entirely. It's about to get bigger and it is about to be filled with children and families of all kinds. Yeah. Holy Spirit has boosted our vision. We can see masses of people. We can sense a move of God, but there's a third thing that happens when we allow Holy Spirit to boost our vision, and that is for more capacity. We have a group in the city of London. It connects different churches together, and they hold regular events of different kinds. Well, they were actually holding an event with... Dr. Murray Lawson from Scripture Union, and it was a kids' ministry thing. And the meeting actually began by affirming kids' ministry as the single most impactful ministry there is. After a big study, I think this one was the Barna Group, guys, it was determined that 80% of Christians in chairs today made a decision for Jesus before the age of nine. Of those that are left, before the age of 12. If you want to see churches filled tomorrow, <laughs> we must pour into children and families today. We must. This is the single most impactful ministry that there is. However, there was another statistic. 
And this one was that 85% of children have had zero contact with church. Zero. That is about to change. That means that we get to frame 85% of children's mindset for God and His goodness. Amen? He told us about this multinational survey they did late last year. Uh, they didn't release any findings, but he was kind. He released some of them to us. And this study actually included uh, churches from 20 different denominations. And again, it was multinational. And there were actually some common themes worldwide. All, all, all recognize that new plans and new paradigm shifts were needed. Things change so quick in the world, guys, and kids move the fastest of them all. But there have been no changes in the way we approach children's ministry. But you want to know what the biggest shock was to come out of the findings? Not a single church, not one out of those surveyed, and usually those being surveyed are on the cutting edge of things, but not a single one had a strategy written down for how they are going to reach and equip children and their families. I was almost jumping in my seat over the Zoom screen. Well, I was. <laughs> this, this is what I needed to do to move forward. This is the next step. Holy Spirit wants us to increase our capacity. He wants to partner with us to create a strategic plan for how to reach children, how to equip their families. And this could very well be the 3D book to the hearts of families and their children. Because, so I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. We're going to gather children because children have the full measure of Holy Spirit. And we are not about top-down leadership. What? So we're going to gather children, we're going to gather parents, we're going to gather grandparents, teachers, and we are going to create a working strategy for how to do this. So trust me, I'm going to be in touch. <laughs> because again, more so than any other ministry, children's ministry is the single most important one that there is, impactful one. Because we have the biggest opportunity to change the world. And if you have been listening, you know that Pastor Carl always says that the responsibility of this generation is? I believe this to be true and even more so today. Let me tell you one of the saddest verses in the Bible is in Judges 2.10. After a whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up that neither knew the Lord or what he had done for Israel. You know what I say? Not on our watch. Not on our watch. Reaching children and equipping families has to happen, and it has to happen with purposeful intentionality. And if you're here and you've been a life changer for a while, you know that one of the verses we prayerfully declare over all of our impact kids is Psalm 76.7. You have taught me from my earliest childhood, and I constantly tell others about the wonderful things you do. We want that to be the testimony of every grown impact kid, that they grew up experiencing God's goodness, and they are constantly telling others about the wonderful things that they know to be true about God. So here, we actually offer to Jesus centered approach to ministry where children really do experience God's goodness where they hear the why and not the what of following Jesus so instead of shoving more behavior focused curriculum at your children we actually share Jesus centered curriculum there is no more behavior modification with Jesus as the tool uh-uh because children need to hear I think we all need to hear that Jesus loves you no matter what. Whether you got the grade, whether you got the goal, whether you listened to mom, whether anything, whether you yelled at your brother, Jesus loves you no matter what, all of the time, without fail. Mm -hmm. 
So we're starting to move from task-focused events more to relational ones. And Impact Nursery and Impact Kids, they are amazing. And we're a place that empowers the young. But there are signs of a great move of God. A great harvest is coming. And we need to increase our capacity. And I am here before you with great humility telling you I actually believe that we are in tune with God's plan in this. And I really want to build something together, something that is bigger than us, bigger than our personalities, and that lasts so much longer than us. You know, there are many voices out there for how we should raise our kids. <laughs> and we can end up pouring into children's educational, athletic social, artistic, and everything else development. But I'm telling you that just as serious is their spiritual development. Sunday school's had its day, but they need more than just another day in the classroom, guys. We don't want to simply create moments for kids, but we want to help them develop um, daily worship habits. Not something we just slot into our day, but a way of living because things are mostly caught, not taught, right? The scariest words in the Bible, imitate me as I imitate Christ. <laughs> but for real, talk about God at home. So kids discover Jesus is someone we value, someone who matters to us, someone we love. Constantly point our children to Jesus. And, and more than just pointing, have physical reminders. Maybe you could put their artwork from Sunday on the fridge. <laughs> Maybe you could put like a Bible verse up on one of those fancy chalkboards. I don't know. But let them watch, let them learn, and make sure that your church family and your family, that we're not strangers. Because as your church family, we actually want to help you, we want to resource you, we want to support you, we want to encourage you as the primary disciplers of your children. And we want to help equip you parents to speak about, model, and value your faith. We want to supplement what you're doing in your home um, by partnering in their important spiritual journey. We want to champion family ministry. And so I just want to take a moment for the impact parents. And I just want to say, man, I applaud you. I know your motives. I know you're doing the best. And I am so proud of each one of you. Grandparents, <laughs> don't underestimate the role you play. After parents, grandparents have the most significant potential on children's faith formation. According to this verse here, it says, don't forget the things your eyes have seen. Don't let them fade from your heart, but teach them to your children and your children's children. We are responsible for discipling two generations. Pray for them daily. You have the relationship with them. Go to their activities, games, programs. Um, you know, tell them faith stories. Give them faith guidance. And honestly, I want to thank you, grandparents. You are making a difference. And a shout out because Brooklyn has the best grandparents, one of which is here. Grandparents, you have a wealth of experience, and I actually want to leverage that wisdom because I'm going to be seeking your advice on how to develop ministry strategy, how to solve problems. I'm, I want to utilize your talents, so I'm coming for you. Oh, listen, Peter also needed more capacity. He had to change his whole entire mindset and expand his mentality. He grew up thinking. He grew up being taught that Gentile people were unclean. But the word actually doesn't describe Cornelius and his family that way. It says that this beautiful family was devout and generous. So in the same way that Peter needed to change his mind about people, oh, that family's messy. They blah, 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 blah. No, when God looks at them, he looks at them with love and he sees everything that's good about them. You see, Peter thought that people had to become Jews, get circumcised, stay kosher, observe the Torah, blah, blah, blah. In other words, people had to believe, then they had to behave a certain way before that they could belong. But God showed him that belong was first. Yes, belong, believe, behave. And sure, it took a while for the rest of the church to catch up with what God was doing. But in the end, 
they decided not to make it hard for Gentiles to know God. And the same holds true for us. We must increase our capacity. We must increase our mindsets because we need to make it easy for children and families to know God. I'm telling you guys, we can hardly handle the children we have now. And it's going to take many more life changers for these masses of people. It's going to take people in the classrooms. It's going to take people preparing snacks. It's going to be, take people building sets. It's going to take many people. Because I see a place where people-driven approaches replace traditional activities and program-driven approaches. Methods actually become relational. Parents are equipped and they are trained to disciple their children as part of the rhythm of family life. Children and parents having fun together. I see a place where children are highly valued. The language, the method, the systems are not all adult-centered, but multi-generational. Get used to that word. A place where kids are showing a lot of hospitality. I see a place where there's new messaging for kids, where entertainment, healing, and behaviors are simply byproducts and not the focus of curriculum. I actually see playgrounds and sensory gardens and magical entryways and care teams and tutoring and sponsoring, like I see all the things. <laughs> I see a place where all children belong. Loud kids, active kids, kids with special needs, quiet kids. So you name the kid, they belong, they fit, they matter. Guys, what I see will require Holy Spirit to boost our vision, to boost our capacity. Right now, we are running the whole of Impact Kids with myself and four other life changers. Impact Nursery has three adults and two youth. Let's change this. <laughs> Let Holy Spirit boost your vision. Let Holy Spirit enlarge our capacity. Because children are not a distraction. They are not a problem to care for. They certainly are not people in waiting. They have unsurpassable worth and they are a gift to us all. Every spiritual journey is equally important. It is worth it. They are worth it. You know, Jesus welcomed children into his presence. He made time. He made space. He raised the level of importance of children in his cultural setting. I say we do the same. I say we let Holy Spirit boost our vision to include masses of people so we can see a move of God by expanding our capacity. I'm going to close off right now. This is what I tell the kids. Uh, just if you want to help pay attention, you can close your eyes. Um, in just a moment, there's going to be some people who are going to be ready to pray for you if you have a need or you have a loved one with a need. I don't know where they gather. Over there. So after, if you want to go over there for some prayer, please feel free to do so. Um, but we're going to close our eyes right now. Pay attention. Um, but if you want to know this love, this goodness of God for yourself, I can send someone to help you chat about, like, your spiritual journey. So I'll count to three, and you can raise your hand on the count of three. One, Jesus loves you. Two, the way to God is made open by him. Three, you can raise your hand now. Good. Thank you. Thank you. We'll send somebody. Um, everybody else, if you would like to be part of changing lives for eternity, I'm actually going to be uh, handing out some volunteer packages on your way out, or you can contact me in the office to explore different ways of serving and impacting families. So we'll close this off in prayer. Oh, God, <laughs> thank you, Holy Spirit, that you boost us. Thank you that you boost our vision, and thank you that you want to include more people, masses of people. Thank you that there is going to be a move of your goodness, and thank you for giving us more capacity. 
I pray right now you'd seal the word in our hearts, and I pray that we would go and love on our neighbors. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.